And of course, you know, the other really big news this week and all year long has been the oil markets. More recently, of course, the saber rattling and finger pointing from President Biden at these oil companies. He's berating them for making, quote, war profits. Uh, of course, he's also threatening a windfall profits tax. I'm going to bring in Bonson Group Managing Director David Bonson. David, first and foremost, I'm going to start right at the top. I got to give you props. I remember you coming on late 2020, early 2021, saying, yeah, I like oil. And I'm kind of, I was kind of skeptical, <laughs> All right? But your rationale was 100% prescient. I just want the audience to understand, this is what's happened to the market since the election. Energy, by far, up 250%, everything else in its shadows. So you saw this coming, President Biden doing for oil what President Obama did for sales of guns and, and of course, gun stocks. But now he wants to confiscate those profits. Does that change anything with the way you're looking at this? Well, it doesn't at all, because, of course, he can't and won't confiscate anything. It's not the way it works in our country. You have to pass it through Congress, and he wouldn't even get the Democrat votes needed, let alone Republican votes. So it's a press conference, and it's a headline, and it uh, sounds like a nice populist status thing to say. But, Charles, you just said something very important. You were commenting on my discussion with you in late 2020, not 21. What is he talking about from 2022, windfall profits? What happened in 2020? They lost tens of billions of dollars. So does the government want a windfall tax when things are good? And right. then do they want to provide a big backstop when things are bad? This company went through the ups and downs of COVID, lost unbelievable amounts of money, kept investing into CapEx, and now the oil companies are generating big profits. The president needs to understand economics works off of cycles. You know, it's so funny you, you would bring that up. So I've just got a chart going back the last uh, 20 years. This is the oil industry. The, this, all these lines at the bottom, folks, these are years they lost money. This is when uh, shell companies, they had negative cash flow. Only in the last two years have they kind of made that up. But throughout all of it, as David points out, they were investing. They were paying uh, people great money to work for them. These companies did an amazing job. But this isn't just, it's not just about, though, David, uh, you know, the idea of a profit, windfall profit tax. Today, for instance, in Axios, there's an article that talks about the role of the SPR in the future. And they say maybe it should not be an emergency fund. They, you know, they say forget about mitigating these spikes. They, instead, they think they can incentivize oil companies, let it be used to buy oil at a certain price. I mean, are you buying into this new rationale that maybe we should have a different role for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Of course not. You can't. It's a quasi nationalization of the U.S. energy industry. Since when does nationalization work? It doesn't work in the countries that did it. Why don't people look at Petrobras and Vale to see how well that did for Brazil 15, 10 years ago? But in the United States, we have a system where companies hurt when they don't do well and they benefit when they do well. The SPR is an emergency reserve that now they have taken down to such a level it's dangerous for when we have a real emergency. A real emergency is supposed to be a war in your own climate, a famine, pestilence, uh, uh, geographical issues, uh, weather issues, not polling yeah. Political polling is not an emergency. That's what we've used the SPR for. Uh, real quick, uh, uh, the leadership uh, in the markets, another major conversation on Wall Street this year, maybe a changing of the guard, old economy, including oil. Oil used to be almost 15 percent of the S&P. It got down to 2 percent. Now it's on the rise. Does this suggest maybe there's a lot more room uh, in the oil markets and maybe even a greater role to play with respect to the overall market? If you don't mind me correcting you, I know exactly what you meant, but it wasn't oil that was 15 energy. percent or is now 4 percent. It was energy right. and energy includes natural gas. It includes coal. It includes a lot of things. We need the energy policy of our country to facilitate growth and opportunity. Natural gas is an environmentally clean fossil fuel relative to others that can expand opportunity. We don't have an alternative. There is no other choice to meet energy needs. I think that this is a bullish story long term, and it's more than just production. It's how we're going to transport it, export it, move it around, store it. There's a lot of right. angles here for investors. Hey, I got 30 seconds. Your thoughts on what we're going to hear from Jay Powell in a few moments. 
well, I think he's going to raise rates by three quarters of a point, and then he's going to read a bunch of cards that sound like they were from another Fed meeting, and then we're going to hear a whole bunch of people say it means this and means that. They're going to stop somewhere in the fours, and then uh, from there, they're going to be forced to admit that they can't tighten their balance sheet. They're going to go back to quantitative easing in 2023. All right. Love it. Concise. David, again, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. 